One of my favorite clips ever, um, and I like adding a little levity when we're talking about security because the security community tends to be very serious, serious, serious. Um, so hi, I'm Ed Marzak, and um, yeah, as mentioned, you might know me from Mac Tech Conference, uh, you might know me from a number of years spent on the Mac Ops team at Google. Um, I recently started a new job at Duo Security in their labs, their research labs department. And I always like working with conference organizers to make sure I'm speaking about something that's relevant to them and their audience. And um, security came up a number of times. And I said, hey, I guess I'm uh, qualified to speak about that, perhaps a little bit. So I want to talk today a little bit about things that you can do for your users to help shepherd them along their way in a way that's respectful to them. Uh, before we get too much further along, see, I did include a QR code um, or just a regular link. This is a link to a document that includes um, links to everything that I speak about or mention, really, that's important. Uh, so you don't need to scroll it down or take uh, you know, screenshots on your phone or something. So I'll give you a second to get that up. And um, while we're waiting on that, um, you know, tough break. Who, who's local? Most people are probably from local Australia. Kind of? Really? Where, who's traveled the furthest to get here, do we think? M maybe. <laughs> it might be. Might be. We have some other New York contingent over there. Um, there might be something further, but you know, I just want to let everyone know, you know, tough break the other night, really tough break, but I am totally behind you, Australia. You know, it was, good. it was a good run, it was a good run. I've been watching the games, I love the games. I've been, uh, I've been doing some local shopping while I'm here. And there you go. I have a great story about Red Eye Records. Um, and I'll tell after this, um, but this big red eyeball is probably going to be kind of creepy if I just leave it here this whole time, so. All right. Everyone have this? That's great. So, why are we here? Um, why are you choosing to sit here for 40 minutes or 45 minutes instead of going getting some tea or something? Um, security is a complicated topic. Um, and people usually have questions about it, and I'm here the remainder of the conference, and we can talk about all the things that I didn't end up covering. Um, before we move uh, much further, though, I just do want to thank Tony and Marcus for having me here, for running this conference. I think this is now the oldest, longest-running Mac-related conference, is it? 16-ish years? Is it 16 now? Yeah, congratulations. That deserves a round of applause, man. So when we talk about security, um, it's kind of funny because the term security is this sort of umbrella term that encompasses a number of things. I know when I went to go start a duo and I said I'm working in security, um, I had other people who are uh, friends who are in security positions and they do things that are totally different. Um, you might meet people in security who do penetration testing. You might people, meet people who do um, uh, corporate security, uh, hardware security, network security. There's, there's a lot of uh, different facets to security. Um, anyone who knows me knows I love Google Images. Um, and I, th these are the first five images that came up when I put in hacker. Hoodie and a bunch of numbers. Hoodie and a bunch of numbers, hoodie typing, hoodie and a bunch of numbers, hoodie, oop, hoodie and a bunch of numbers, ones and zeros. It's always ones and zeros. Um, so I thought, well, what about security? What's the sort of stereotype on security? First five images, guy in a suit padlock, 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 guy in a suit padlock. 
So we might have some trouble in the security industry sort of like overcoming these stereotypes and helping people understand. Like I don't even understand what these pictures are trying to depict necessarily. I guess a padlock is secure and a guy in a suit is trustworthy, maybe? I don't know. Probably not. Um, and the security industry is also very often tripping over itself to tell everyone all the things we need to worry about. Some of them you do, some of them you don't. So, what do we actually have to worry about? Um, we're here because this is a Mac and Apple focused event. Um, we all you know, use our Macs and our iOS devices. Uh, so we're secure, right? Apple does a great job. Well, Apple does a pretty good job. I think they're one of the better vendors in terms of uh, security and making sure their devices are secure, but of course they're not perfect. They every now and then release these security updates and uh, they have tons of fixes and things. And the important thing about these updates is you go and look um, and you read the description for a particular vulnerability, the magic phrase that you are looking for is execute arbitrary code. That means Apple has patched something that if someone was take, to take advantage of this vulnerability, they could run any code they want as root on your machine. And Apple has definitely been um, getting better about what a root level user can do, even if they get access on your machine. Um, but it's still something you would rather avoid. If you want to know more about any of these vulnerabilities, you want to look at the CVE number. CVE stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. It's a database that is not just for Apple, but anytime any vendor has a security uh, issue that they're going to patch, they get it in the database. And the pattern is CVE, four numbers, those four numbers are always the year that the vulnerability was reported. And the next set of numbers are a sequential number. It's a monotonically increasing number every time a new entry gets added to the database. So this particular one is the 4,196th uh, entry. Uh, again, not just from Apple, from all vendors. Um, and it's not just our devices, of course, right? We use these secure devices, but then we go off and we store things in the cloud. We use online services, we use uh, you know, Instagram or Snapchat, and our data is getting stored in the cloud. Or even through a web browser, if you stored some information uh, because you sent something via FedEx, well, FedEx um, didn't look very carefully after some of their cloud storage, had an open S3 bucket, and it exposed all their data, and unfortunately, the first line of this is very correct in what has become an alarmingly routine occurrence. Um, so, we can look after our devices, um, but it's not always our own devices. Sometimes we're storing data elsewhere. Um, and one of the other things that I'm gonna come back to in a little bit um, when it comes to security, uh, because we're so connected, there are things like clickjacking attacks and our devices run code in the form of JavaScript or whatever in the browser when we're connecting to websites. And that has become a vector that we can uh, get malware on our machines and devices from. So there's a lot to worry about, but what do we actually have to worry about? And I'm sorry if anyone feels duped. Um, you think you'd come to a session uh, about security and I would be able to tell you what you have to worry about, but this is really the one thing that I can't tell you about. Uh, this is something that is not a one-size-fits-all solution for. Um, what you need to do is come up with your threat model. And if this is a term you haven't heard before, it sounds scarier than it is, um, but it's just your plan on how to deal with threats. So, the threat model makes you ask, what do you value and what risks are there to those things that you value? Um, I hear a lot of people talk about high value systems. You know, we wouldn't want someone hacking into our financial database. Well, sure, good, good plan. Um, depending on your threat model, you may or may not care if people are trying to hack into the system that, I don't know, stores lunch menus or something. Um, 
that might not be a devastating hack if someone were to get in. However, attackers often get into some low-level system and move around from there. So based on your threat model that you put together, um, that may or may not be important. And again, this all comes back to the importance and value you place on different systems. Um, so if you're a threat model, like if you're one of my kids, your threat model is your sister. And you know, uh, that's solved by strong passwords. Boom, problem solved. If your problem is you know, constant attacks because um, you know, you're a high profile company, um, you know, probably you know, Google and Facebook and Microsoft face constant, constant attacks just because of their uh, prominence in the industry, um, you're gonna have a different threat model. Um, and if your threat model is a three-letter government agency, um, you're in the wrong place. You should probably just take all your technology, throw it in the trash, and don't show your face again. Um, the threat model on that is kind of interesting. If the CIA wants to rain down hell upon you, the CIA will rain down hell upon you. Um, something else in your threat model, who has access to different systems? Um, very often, uh, people who don't need particular access to different systems um, have access. <laughs> Why? Because no one ever audited it or looked at it or cared. Um, so probably all the people don't always need access to all the things. Um, and that leads me to something I'll call the new basics. And I've been speaking with people at the conference that I had a chance to meet with uh, yesterday, and I've been speaking to people outside of this conference. And um, who's heard of um, Beyond Corp as a, as a concept? Okay, not, not that many of you. So when I started in this industry quite some time ago, there was something called the 80-20 rule. And that was around network traffic, and that meant that 80% of your network traffic would be restricted to your local LAN. It would either originate or end in your local network, um, and the other 20% would be off network. Well, ha, 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 that's a very 1990s rule because we don't do that anymore thanks to things like this um, and things like this. Uh, but even the ones that don't move around very much are constantly sending network traffic off of your local LAN. And the concept with BeyondCorp, if you haven't heard of it, is that you should treat every network as untrusted, even your local network. So the security model of having one way in and one way out of your network that's protected by a firewall um, and all you're worried about is firewall rules um, is kind of dated because if an attacker gets past that firewall, they have the entire local network to move around. Uh, they sort of have the keys to the kingdom, access to everything. Uh, the Beyond Corp model, you might have also heard this referred to as zero trust networking. Uh, there's an, even an O'Reilly book for this. It's the lobster book, I guess. Uh, I never know why they assign particular animals, but it's the lobster book. And one of the key concepts to Beyond Corp is where is your authorization and authentication decision happening now? Particularly, um, as we've moved forward in time, very, very often that decision happens in the cloud, not even on your local network. If you are a G Suite customer, you're doing all this uh, authentication against Google, against G Suite. So it's up in the cloud. It's not even on your local network. Um, and the other thing Beyond Corp makes you ask is, where is your network perimeter? In the old model, you tried to contain your network perimeter to one single building or this local LAN or maybe a WAN uh, across you know, two or three buildings. Uh, but again, thanks to all these devices being mobile now, your network perimeter basically is anywhere that there's a network. It's the whole planet, anywhere that someone can bring their laptop, uh, their mobile device, whatever, um, because very often people are working from a coffee shop, from their friend's house, uh, from wherever they can, you know, uh, for whoever of us flew here, you know, you get kind of desperate. You're like, ah, oh, free, free airport Wi-Fi, right? Like, I need my hit. Um, 
you'll log on to any network, and most of these are very untrusted networks. Uh, a few years ago, I uh, got to see a talk from someone at JPL. Their network perimeter was satellites, um, so anywhere that they could uh, get satellite networking, and maybe this is our future, but for right now, it's pretty much any place on Earth is our network perimeter. So I think Beyond Corp makes us realize your endpoints are frightened and alone. Aw. Um, don't feel bad for them because we can, we can help out in a, in a number of ways. So what can we do about this? Um, one of the first things that I'll mention isn't necessarily a technological uh, decision that you have to make, um, but security requires empathy. And we should have some empathy for our end users and put ourselves in their shoes. Because while we're the smart ones when it comes to technology and all the things that we do, um, pretty much everyone at our company that is not in a technological role, they're hired because they're really smart at whatever it is that they do, whether that's sales or legal or marketing or whatever. And, and frankly, they just want to get their jobs done. And it's up to us to try to help them get their jobs done without getting in their way. Um, or at the very least, explaining to them why we're doing the things that we need to do. That uh, third slide that I showed earlier that talked about you know, getting malware through links, uh, that bothers me so much, <laughs> right? Like, I think the security community is very fast to pounce on people uh, who aren't uh, technology focused all the time and say like, well, of course you got malware, you clicked on a link. And that bothers me so much because links are for clicking on. That's why they exist. That's it. You know, we made this thing called the web with hyperlinks and that you can get malware just by clicking on a link shows that something's horribly broken and it's not the fault of our end users. Um, so I think one of the first things that we can do uh, to have some empathy for our end users is have good security education. We should be running security training for our, uh, for our corporate users, if you're, a, um, if you're a consultant, make sure you take the time to explain the why to your end users. But particularly in corporate environments, if you do an annual security training um, and explain why, um, I think that goes a long way to building bridges with the people that we serve um, to help them understand why we ask them to do certain things, why something on their machine might be disabled or why we don't want them to run certain software. Um, you know, like if they download MacKeeper and they're just told they can't run it, someone's gonna get frustrated. But if you explain to people, hey, we don't allow MacKeeper because when you run it, it's gonna look at all your data and send it up to servers in Russia, I think our end users tend to be very thankful that we're uh, helping them along the way there not um, you know, move their data <laughs> to places that they didn't expect it. Something you can cover in security training or would be suspect notifications. So um, help end users understand when they see a pop-up, is that expected, is that not expected? Um, lost equipment, that's another one I find that's really useful to help people uh, through. Um, no one really likes to talk about getting robbed or they're embarrassed because they left their laptop in a cab or on a plane or something like that. Um, so I think it's really useful to help explain to our end users that there's a procedure in place. Um, if you have lost your equipment, we're not gonna judge you. It's, you know, sorry, it's no big deal. Um, and if you don't have a procedure in place for dealing with lost equipment and remotely wiping it, that's something that you should probably get on top of. Um, Security education around phishing. Um, phishing attacks are getting better all the time, um, and they can be very effective, and they can fool people. Um, this is the logo of an open source project called GoFish, written by a coworker of mine, and it allows you to run phishing campaigns, you know, against, you know, use them against your own domains. You know, don't want to give anyone any ideas. Um, but you can run them against your own uh, team, or company, uh, and this will give you all the analytics about who clicked on it and did they forward it to other people, and it's, it's a really great system and it's open source. And then one of the other things I like to ensure we train our end users on is don't leave a trail. And this can be a tough one because 
we leave a trail all the time, right? We log on to this local Wi-Fi and it knows our MAC address and then we go look at websites and they're logging our IP addresses and we post you know, a picture on Twitter, hey, I'm at Xworld, this is awesome, and it geotags it. And just by being a part of the internet, we're leaving a trail all the time. But there is a certain baseline that's kind of acceptable. But I saw this on Twitter two weeks ago. 12 years at Google today, thanks Sundar Pichai. Here's a picture of my badge. I have no idea what compelled them to post a picture of their badge because they had a work anniversary. Um, if there's anything an attacker really loves, it's fitting in. And one way to fit in is have a valid picture of someone's uh, work credentials. Um, so yeah, this was still up. I was shocked that no one from Google security pounced on this guy, but, um, but this is, you know, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is sort of step one. Step two, this is from LinkedIn. LinkedIn is an attacker's gold mine. Um, thanks, Steve, for posting a picture of your badge and your business card, and now we know you use RSA tokens. Um, so again, I can understand people being excited, and again, it's just, we haven't explained to people why doing something like this is a problem. Um, and one other way that we should train our users to not leave a trail is if they, and this, <laughs> this is a technology example, so this goes for us as well. Um, you will find all sorts of examples in vendor product forums where people go for help for their router or for whatever, and they talk about all the problems that they're having at work. My manager hates me, my boss is cheap, my coworkers do this or that. And again, if there's anything an attacker likes to exploit, it's just like, you know, this is just giving them more information to work with when they're trying to attack your organization. So um, if someone needs to post something on an external site, great, it's no problem. You need help, that's fine. Keep it contained to the relevant technology details uh, and don't go into your, <laughs> your work problems. Um, so we wanna educate our users and we wanna empower our users. We want our users to be able to take care of problems on their own as much as possible. Uh, Netflix, oh, I don't know, three or four weeks ago, released open source their app called Stethoscope. Has anyone seen this? Is this, you've seen it, yeah, a few people have seen it. I thought this was really cool. So this uh, lets end users see themselves if their device is in compliance with security policy and tells them why. Your system's up to date, your firewall's enabled, disk encryption, et cetera, et cetera. If one of those things weren't uh, up to date, they would get a you know, red mark and they could go fix it themselves. I think that's great. Um, the Stethoscope app is a client and a server piece. So the server piece, if you see in the bottom corner here, it says view all devices. An end user can then go to a web portal and see all of their devices and if any of them are not in compliance, they can then go get help for that. Um, not a great screenshot, but Google has also released open source uh, MO menu, and that's linked in your doc. And the cool thing about MO menu is that it's a menu bar app where each item in the, uh, the menu that comes up is an application. So you can go write an application um, that does whatever you want, and whether that's letting your end users know uh, about their status or having it go off and fetch data, this is a great foundation to build on top of. Um, Two-factor authentication, this is a, a great way to help our end users uh, be safe and secure. Is everyone using two-factor authentication? Okay, not as many hands as I'd like to see. Um, we should be using two-factor pretty much everywhere possible. Two-factor authentication, if you're not familiar with it, is when you log into a website, it accepts your password, but then it challenges you to uh, do something with some other factor, whether that's putting in a code, and I'll show that in a second. Um, some of them look at presence. If anyone has seen the YubiKeys, uh, you have to tap a physical device on your computer to let it know that, yes, a human is making this request. Um, you might not be surprised to find out Duo Security has a 
second factor product. It's called Duo Mobile. You can go download this. You can use it for Duo Push, which is a business level um, application, but it also does timed OTPs, which is one of the most popular ways to do second factor. Google also has an, uh, a second factor product called Authenticator, and it does timed OTPs. Um, one of my favorites is 1Password, and 1Password uh, is a password manager, and I think uh, I probably should have also included that in the uh, security training uh, section because we should train our users to have really, really long passwords and just store them in a password manager and not worry about them. Um, but um, 1Password will store your password and it will store a timed one-time password. Um, for anyone who's really into this, you will say, Ed, but that's not real two-factor authentication, and I would agree. Um, it's not two-factor authentication if you're storing your OTP in the same place that you're storing your passwords, because then an attacker could just look in the same place for both. However, this is one of those empathy things that I'm talking about. This is much better than not doing it all, and it really strikes a great balance between you know, security heavy-handedness and ease of use. I think this is a good balance that shows that. Uh, one of the other reasons I like 1Password is it integrates with uh, Duo Push two-factor, so you can use it for that as well. And we should help our users and yourselves use two-factor authentication wherever possible, not only for our work accounts, but for our personal accounts. And there's this great website called twofactorauth.org that is linked in that document. And you can search for a website that maybe you already have an account on, or you're looking to find out if a certain site already supports two-factor. Um, you can search that site. It will tell you if that uh, provider uh, takes two-factor authentication and how to enroll in it if it does. So that's really useful. Single sign-on. How many people are providing their, their work uh, mates with single sign-on? Yeah, all right, that's a good number of hands. That's really good. Um, single sign-on allows us to sign on in one place, and then that token gets passed around to applications on the back end, so people don't have to keep entering their passwords. Um, you might not be surprised to find out. Duo has a single sign-on product. Um, you sign into the Duo access gateway, and it presents you this menu, and you can go log into all of these different applications, whether that's Office 365 or uh, Box. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. Google also has uh, an SSO uh, a setup that if you're a G Suite customer and you're the admin for the domain, you can go into the control panel um, and set up single sign-on, so people can sign on to G Suite, and then be automatically signed in to a number of other applications if those applications support security, assertion, and markup language, SAML. Something that we can be doing for our clients that helps us sort of stay out of their way, but just sort of be a watchful eye, is to detect problems. Um, again, our end users are really just trying to get their jobs done. And if we can sort of be the security system, the watchful eye, uh, and let them know that there's a problem, possibly before that they know there's a problem, we're doing our jobs really well. Um, one of the ways we can do that is with OS Query. Um, if you're sort of reading the tea leaves correctly, um, I think everybody in this room should be learning OS Query or familiar with it. Um, the Netflix stethoscope app that I mentioned earlier, that's built on top of OS Query. Um, for anyone who hasn't heard of OS Query, it allows you to make SQL queries for machine state on machines in our fleet or across the fleet. And it's incredibly powerful, and it has a great community that's grown up around it now. Um, they just had their uh, a first conference around OS Query called QueryCon, and it seemed uh, to be really, really cool, and the, the community around OS Query, again, is growing. And right on their site, uh, osquery.io, there's a whole section. I mean, this is just the first three, but there's pages and pages of things that tie into OS Query. So if you haven't heard of it, you should go check it out. Um, if you've heard of it and have meant to start using it, you should set up a test instance of OS Query. 
And we get to be the watchful eye around, you know, over our users by doing a lot of logging. That's usually what you have to do to see what's going on on a machine. If you like paying for stuff, uh, that might be Splunk. Uh, Splunk does an excellent job at collecting logs, letting you sort through them and search, uh, and alerting you if there are problems. If you don't like paying for stuff, there's an open source uh, uh, stack called Elk Stack. Uh, that's actually, Elk stands for the three open source products that Elk Stack comprises, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. And it's more or less an open source replacement for Splunk. You throw a bunch of logs in there, you can sort through them, uh, and you can alert yourself. Um, and there's another open source project called Zentral. And um, Zentral sort of does a bit of everything, which is really cool. It's the one central place that you can use to manage all of your Macs. And um, it does, at least in this part about logging, it will accept logs, store them, um, and alert you if there are problems that it finds in the logs. I think that's a pretty cool product. And source, when I say source, I mean, let's understand the provenance of the tools that we're using and that we roll out for our end users. Uh, I know there was a workshop on Docker yesterday, and Docker is this really popular container um, system. Uh, and Docker has what they call the Docker Hub, and it's a place that you can create Docker images and upload them for the rest of the community to use. But they just found that 17 of those Docker images had malware on them and you know, uh, were sending your credentials and things off to other services. So uh, that's not cool. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't have the statistics. I guess only Docker does, but who knows how many times these were downloaded, who knows where they're being used. Um, people do like downloading things from the internet and using them in production, so who knows, right? Um, and I think about this a lot when it comes to auto package. I think auto package is a fantastic tool uh, for Mac administrators, uh, provides a quick, reliable um, way to package products that can be kind of a pain, um, but it relies on going off to GitHub and downloading recipes from GitHub that help you package. And these recipes, of course, run with elevated privileges on your local Mac. Um, that scares the hell out of me. So um, if I were using auto package, um, again, it's a great system, and I, there's no malintent, but it would be really easy to own an organization if you knew what recipes they used and you made the right changes just up on GitHub, and they're gonna download them and use them. Um, I would take a copy of all of that internally, and then any time I used a recipe, I would compare it with known good baselines. Um, but I think this is a symptom of this. How many times have people seen instructions to install something, and the instructions are, yeah, 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 just open up terminal, curl, pipe it to bash, and it'll install things. Um, again, I think all of us can help our end users and ourselves by maybe just run curl without piping it into bash, look at the script, make sure it's not doing anything strange. Um, very often we see these types of instructions from websites where it's just, hey, just go open up terminal and type this thing. Um, that's very common, right, where you see instructions, you're trying to fix something, and they say, go type these things into terminal, and you copy, paste, return, copy, paste, return. Um, it's really up to us to make sure the things that we're copying and pasting uh, are understood, and we, we know that they're not doing any, uh, n nothing untoward. So, I definitely think you should dig in when you see um, the products that you're downloading and rolling out to your fleet. If you're using open source, that's great. Use the source, Luke. You can just read through the source. Uh, if you have, uh, in a larger company, you might have uh, an AppSec group, you can just give them the source and say, please go do you know, a review on this, make sure it's okay for us to roll out. Not everyone's using open source. You might just have a binary. If you only have a binary, use the source, Luke. Um, or maybe not the source. For anyone who doesn't recognize the picture, that's Michael Lynn, um, also known as, <laughs> in the best Star Wars, uh, uh, 
pose I could find. Um, Michael Lynn, uh, you might know him as Froger, for anyone who's on um, Mac admin Slack. And he is known for uh, being sort of easily nerd sniped into reverse engineering things for people and digging in and finding, uh, finding the answers sort of deep down and buried in, in code. And Michael's a lovely person and he's super smart and we're, we're really lucky to have him in the community. But I do wanna say he's not the only person that can do this. You can do this too. There are a number of tools that are right on your machine, um, either out of the box or maybe you need Xcode like LLDB requires Xcode, but they're free and they let you poke at binaries and see what they do. Um, you know, one of the easiest ones is strings that will uh, report back on any sort of ASCII looking string in a binary. And it's so easy to find things that way. Um, and very often um, you go off and you find these things and a month later you mention it to someone, they say, how did you know that? Um, strings, fairly sort of straightforward. Um, these are all in the docs so you don't have to copy them down, but um, these are all tools that I kind of use to poke at binaries. Uh, if you need to go beyond these tools or you like spending money, um, one of my favorite tools is called Hopper. It's a disassembler and it strikes the right balance between a lot of power and being relatively affordable. I think the last time I checked it was 150 US dollars or so, um, which if that sounds expensive, go look at Ida Pro, which runs in the thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, and then there's another disassembler that I like a lot called Binary Ninja, and it sort of complements Hopper really well. It does some things that Hopper doesn't do really that well, and Hopper does some things that Binary Ninja doesn't necessarily do well, but there are plenty of ways to go dig into things that you might not have the source code to. And with all this logging and all this poking around, what we really want to do for our end users is quarantine and prevent malware from running in the first place. And if it does run, we wanna quarantine it to that person's machine so it's not running rampant through our fleet. And we can do that with the open source tool from Google called Santa. Has anyone heard of Santa? Yeah, about half, that's good. Santa is a binary whitelisting and blacklisting utility and it's open source. Um, so it's a great way to stop unknown software from running at all on a machine. Uh, and if you like spending money or you need someone to point your finger at when things don't work, uh, there's Carbon Black, which can do a lot of the same things as Santa. And, 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 and there's plenty of stuff uh, that you can go buy or do. Um, but if there's anything that I think I want you to take away from everything that I just said, it's that we're the smart ones we need to help our end users understand why we're asking them to do the things that we want them to do. Um, and that requires a little empathy for them. And with that, uh, I thank you very much.